Thank you. Good luck. Thanks, Jason. The volume okay? You hear me okay? Um, well, I want to first just thank uh, Rajam for inviting me and uh, allowing me to share some of my thoughts and interests related to compassion uh, and mindfulness uh, training, as well as uh, the investigation of this, as well as the, um, the teaching of this, and, and the practice in, in our own lives. Um, so yeah, thanks Rajam for having me. It's been a very excellent lineup of speakers. I've enjoyed the discussions and, and conversations I've had in the last few days. So um, my intention for today is uh, to, again, mindfulness is, even though the name would indicate otherwise, it's actually more of uh, an embodied experience rather than a cognitive sort of process. So my intention was to really um, guide us through the practice a little bit, have it be more experiential. Um, at least for the first half or so before I move into uh, talking a little bit about some of the, the attitudes that help to, to cultivate uh, this, this uh, quality. And then I'll go into a little bit of um, research, a very brief summary of research related to mindfulness and compassion, chat a little bit about sort of the psychological well-being evidence, the evidence related to sort of biomarkers or neuroplasticity, and then describe briefly some of the research related to compassion for others as well as self-compassion. And then we'll, hopefully I'll guide you through another little practice, a sort of a, what's called a social diet or pair and share, uh, and some interoceptive uh, mindful listening at the end. So that was, that was my intention. Also, I should just say I'm a first generation Greek American, so I'm kind of, my conflict of interest here is I'm contractually obligated to put in lots of images of Greek mythology, so you'll see, see that sort of throughout the talk. I did want to call out Mike Stewart. I noticed his references to Socrates, so if he wants the membership card to the Greek club, he can, he can see me afterwards. He's in. So um, I've shared my intentions. Um, I would invite you to uh, kind of reflect a little bit on your intentions and also to take this time if, you, if you're looking at a device, if you're writing something down to just pause put the laptop down, and just to spend some time, if you're comfortable doing so, close your eyes or have a soft gaze forward, just to kind of create a little bit of a space to prime us for the practice a little bit. And I'd like you to just reflect on what your intentions are, I guess, in coming here, perhaps. Or perhaps just, you know, thinking of, of those friends, family, patients who have inspired you to be here, who helped to support you uh, in your professional endeavors. And also just to, you know, give yourself a little congratulations for taking the time to come and be in a conference room when it's lovely outside and you could be spending time with other loved ones. Okay, and if your eyes are closed, you can open them. And um, I usually find it helpful to, to kind of settle into uh, the meditation, the sitting meditation, which I'll be guiding you through a bit by first starting with some movement. So kind of just dropping into the body a little bit. So uh, I'll just guide us through a five minute sort of blended uh, movement practice here with some music just to get us up and moving around a little bit. And I guess the three sort of principles, if you want um, to kind of think about as you go into this practice, is that uh, allow yourself to just sort of be as you are, let go of the self-judging that can oftentimes occur in a, a group sort of movement practice. Uh, it's also really helpful with meditative movements to go a lot more slowly than you would typically with, with other forms of exercise and to do so intentionally, consciously. And I guess the other sort of tenant with this is that less, less is often more with, uh, with these types of practices. So I would invite you to come up to standing, maybe push your chairs into the table so that you have a little bit of space. I appreciate there's some limitations here in the, in the space we have, but just coming into a...
going to lead us through a little bit of experiment. I don't know how it's all going to work out. So with all the tables here present, but we'll do the best we can. So we're going to do, I'm going to guide us through a little walking meditation, and then maybe we'll trickle in a, a kind of a loving kindness practice with that, and I'll explain as we go through it. I think, um, again, typically I'm leading this in a, in a kind of an open space, but I think given the configuration of the room, what we'll try to do, uh, it'll be more of a community practice, I guess, um, is we'll, we'll just create a, a one long line. So it's like a, a Greek dance without the hand, holding hands and the upa. So you'll, <laughs> You know, maybe let's start um, here at this edge, and, and if we can all get in a single line and kind of S down the middle and then up and around that way, uh, we'll, do, uh, we'll get into that figure. And if we could do that in silence, kind of maintain the silence, that would be helpful. So as, as best we can, creating as much space as we have. If this were a Greek wedding, we'd be going outside right now and opening the doors. But uh, good. So as everyone's, we're, everyone's almost there. So kind of one long circuitous line. And I guess this uh, starting right here, you guys will be the, the lead, and we'll just sort of go, you know, along. I don't think everyone's almost there. Uh, hopefully, it won't feel too crowded, but. Um, I guess being mindful of one another here, as best as we can, we're just going to go in a very slow walk in silence all together. Um, and when you're doing this, you're going to just try to more or less place the feet as your object of attention. If, you, if you're feeling bold, you can take your shoes off. That's nice to kind of get more of a sensory experience with the feet, but you can keep them on if you like. Um, and so we're going to just go through um, a little bit of a walk together. And once you get to where you started, go ahead and go back to your chair, okay? So maybe this will take a minute or two, depending on the coordination. Let's give it a go. Um, when you hear the bell, uh, I'll have everyone just go back to their, their chairs, okay? So go ahead and walk in silence in a clockwise direction, if we can figure that out. And if you would like, you can kind of focus your, your gaze in front of you, maybe you know, five or so feet in front of you. Just noticing sensations in the feet as they contact the ground. And if you'd like, if this feels a little too restricting, maybe find your own space and, and just quarter off your own space. If you'd like, you can add a little bit of um, a self-compassion practice to this. So repeating silently to yourself, it may be every other step. It could be something like, may I be safe with one step? with the other steps saying and reciting to yourself, may I be happy. Third step, may I be healthy. And fourth step, may I be at ease. Or whatever word, whatever phrase speaks to you in your own words, those are just some suggestions. Maybe letting go of that tendency to judge and kind of go, What's, what is this about? This is weird. All common thoughts.
and then we'll um, go ahead when you've more or less gotten to where you started, or if not, even go ahead and just sort of go back to your seat again, sort of with that same pace of walking, if you could. And then I'll just sort of go through a little bit of a brief body scan and awareness of the breath practice. And what we're trying to do with this, I guess really the main principles of this next practice that we'll be doing, is just to find, find a posture for you that evokes that sense of, of both dignity and ease. So upright, but with, with ease. And then the other real basic instruction here is just to be aware of the sensations of the body and the breath, moment to moment. That's really what the practice is about. It's going to be quite normal for the mind to start drifting away, even in a short practice. And the only uh, goal really is just to redirect uh, back to the body or the breath. So um, yeah, go ahead and, and have a seat. And we'll get into that posture. You're welcome to use the backrest, but if you're able to come forward so that your spine is a little away from the backrest, that can help to, to facilitate a little bit more attention to the body and the trunk. And preferably the feet are you know, touching the floor, not crossed. The arms can be at your lap. If you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes or you can keep them open kind of a soft gaze. And we'll start with just drawing attention to the body. Beginning maybe at the feet. Maybe just noticing just the sensation of the feet inside your shoes. Or just the contact of the feet on the ground. And then shifting our awareness up to the legs. And just noticing sensations. You may not notice any sensations, and that's completely fine, too. And then continuing to shift your awareness up across the knees. Sensing and feeling the muscles of the thighs. And drawing our attention towards the pelvis, maybe the point of contact of the pelvis on the seat. And then continuing up to the spine. and the belly and the contents of the belly. And here you might notice the breath in the belly. And shifting up to the mid back and upper back. Sensing the rib cage. Perhaps you sense movement there in the chest. Maybe feeling and sensing the lungs. Expand and relax and recoil. And directing your attention to the hands, the fingertips. Maybe noting temperature changes. And again, shifting up towards the forearms and elbows, and the upper arms and shoulders, and the 
neck. Maybe noticing on the in-breath if you can sense the air coming in through the throat. And then just sensing the head. Maybe the muscles around the face. And sensing the tongue in the mouth, and the jaw muscles. And then directing our attention to the breath. Maybe just noticing where you where you sense the breath most prominently on the inhale. Maybe it's the nose or the throat or chest or belly, wherever it is, just sort of rest your attention in that place that feels most prominent for you. And just follow that flow, ride that wave of the breath. Not trying to change the breath, just being with the breath. And then when you hear the bell, uh, you can slowly open your eyes. It's usually nice to um, sort of slowly orient yourself to, to the room again. Okay, great. So thanks for indulging me with that. I guess I forgot to, I was going to ask initially if uh, by show of hands, just to get a little lay of the land, um, how many people uh, have a, uh, a meditative practice? Oh, right, wow, a fair number of you, okay. And um, how about a, like a, is that more of a movement practice, a, a formal movement practice? Is it a formal sitting practice? Okay, okay, great, All right, so this is this is old hat for many of you then. Okay, so uh, I want to chat a little bit about some of the foundational attitudes that strengthen and support mindfulness. It's also kind of bi-directional because as with the practice of mindfulness, you, you will also see some of these attitudes strengthen as a result of, of cultivating mindfulness. Um, but essentially, um, I think uh, you know, uh, one of my teachers, uh, Christian Wolf, summarizes this really well in terms of essentially the three marks of existence with, with regards to to, to to, to life, essentially, that's a little bit more of a sort of a Buddhist uh, sort of philosophy or psychology, if you will. But it kind of boils down to essentially three things. Uh, shit happens, right? Um, there's always going to be something or somebody that's going to cause us stress or suffering. That's just the nature of, of life, isn't it? Everything changes is essentially another mark of existence, right? Your impermanence is essentially is the fact of life. The only thing that's really constant is change itself. And the third thing, I think, in terms of, of the marks of existence is this idea of just not taking things personally, right? We can see it as just more the part of being a human. So these things are kind of, kind of distilled down into kind of all of the esoteric stuff that kind of is at the, at the heart of it, what, what sort of the cultivation of mindfulness is, is, is about. Uh, mindfulness, compassion, these are some terms that maybe are, of course, they're very closely interrelated, mind and heart, that's the sort of what mindfulness is all about. But oftentimes it can be compartmentalized. Um, I'll kind of give you a little bit of a sense that mindfulness has a little bit more of a, of a cooling tone. It's essentially the... the Typical definition of mindfulness is this present moment non-judgmental awareness. That's kind of the, the classic uh, secular definition of mindfulness that's used in research and, and, um, and, and sort of Western uh, society. 
it essentially has this sort of quality of having uninvolved receptivity. It's sort of a non-doing mode. And it's more of like a resting with experience. In contrast to that, although there's a lot of overlap, as I mentioned, compassion has a lot more sort of, of a warming tone. It's uh, oftentimes referred to in, as loving kindness or meta practice. It's more active. It's a kind turning towards suffering, both one's own suffering as well as those of others. And the key, and again, the distinction between empathy, which is a component of compassion, and compassion is that aim of trying to relieve that suffering to whatever degree is possible. Okay, so again, actively directed practice. It's more of a radiating out quality or embracing experience. And then there are you know, typically some attitudes that help to cultivate mindfulness. And I want to describe a little bit of some of those. And I've kind of uh, connected um, some quotes or sayings that I think kind of embody that, that attitude or concept. The first is curiosity. Uh, what is it here that I'm not yet aware of? And I think there's a lot of overlap with one I'll be mentioning later called beginner's mind. There's this quality or attitude of kindness. And when kindness is present, oftentimes judgment and harshness recede. And I think oftentimes it's, uh, no one likes to be judged, whether you're uh, a patient or just a, a person that doesn't have pain. Um, and I think the, this quote from Deepa Ma uh, really kind of encapsulates this that quality of kindness. And she sort of states that when you're aware, aren't you also kind? When you're kind, aren't you also aware? Gratitude and generosity, they often, I think, kind of couple very closely together. Gratitude, again, is this about shifting our attention to more peace and contentment and calm. Uh, generosity is more that deepening of our understanding of the interconnection that we have uh, between both the givers and the receivers. Thich Nhat Hanh, one of the, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize and, and famous Vietnamese monk, uh, monks said that my actions are my only true belongings. And I think that encapsulates that attitude of gratitude and generosity quite well. There's this attitude of, of acceptance. And by that, it's more of just essentially active turning toward a situation and realizing that that's just really how the way it is right now. And I think, again, we, there was some talk about that in some previous talks, how that can be a, a loaded term uh, when we're talking about acceptance. And, and perhaps willingness might be something, or letting go or letting be might be uh, sort of something that you could communicate with, uh, with, uh, with your patients. Um, there's this idea, or again, this quality of non-judging. So just seeing that oftentimes things are just a product of our habit mind. We don't have to reinforce them. Henry David Thoreau, I think, says this quite well. And it's that not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. This attitude of non-striving, and that's, again, being fully present in the moment without the need to change it. It's moving from that doing mode into more open being mode. I mentioned this quality of letting go or, or letting be. And that's really essentially to grow our ability to see where we're caught. Oftentimes, it's diversion. Uh, or I should say aversion or desire, and, and to leave it alone. Uh, Viktor Frankl, this Austrian uh, neuro uh, neurologist and psychiatrist who was also a Holocaust survivor, said it very, very succinctly and uh, poignantly in that between stimulus and response, there is space. In that space is the power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And so that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to cultivate that growth mindset. There's this attitude of patience, right? So the need to get there. It's oftentimes why we're so rarely here, right? We're very multitask oriented in terms of our culture and productivity oriented. Uh, and so oftentimes we find that things just essentially need to unfold in their own time. And some sort of ending attitudes, uh, humor. Humor is, again, just not being over-identified this situation. You heard Ricard talk about fusion of thoughts, seeing our habit mind, creating that space, finding amusement, and just being human. Uh, Suzuki Roshi, a Zen uh, monk, said this very well in that what we're doing here is so important, we better not take it too seriously. There's this attitude of trust, trusting ourselves. It's really essentially mandatory if we really want to live a meaningful life. Ralph Waldo Emerson put it very well that what lies behind us, what lies before us, are small matters compared to what lies within us. And that's something that we're trying to cultivate with the practice of mindfulness. 
And then lastly, I alluded to this earlier, the beginner's mind, that curiosity, that sort of allowing new information that you might have overlooked or had been biased to in a certain way, and bringing back that sort of sense of wonder or awe to things that we don't necessarily think are worth paying attention to. Okay? And so uh, Suzuki also famously said, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the experts, there are a few. And that kind of alludes to that, that sort of tone or quality of having some humility there are often described some components of, uh, essentially four components of compassion. The first being more that cognitive or that empathetic component, that awareness that suffering is present in others. There's also an effective dimension to that where you have a sympathetic concern that's related to uh, being emotionally moved by that suffering. There's also an intentional component to compassion which is that wish to see the relief of that suffering in that person. And lastly, there's a motivational component, that responsiveness, that readiness to help relieve the suffering. OK, I'm a little bit five minutes or so over. I think we'll, we'll be fine. Um, so I want to chat a little bit about mindfulness and compassion research. And again, just briefly summarizing a few things. I think uh, Dr. Richard Davidson, one of the neuroscientists who started to, to look at, at, at neuroimaging of, of well-trained sort of Tibetan monks, uh, put it very succinctly in this idea of these four constituents of well-being. So what does all the, the research related to mindfulness, compassion, what does it distill down to? What does it promote in terms of well-being? Well, uh, the first is that it helps to cultivate resilience, that resilience being that rapidity uh, with which you recover from adversity. The second thing that helps with uh, mindfulness training in terms of contributing to well-being is outlook. It helps us to have a more positive uh, viewpoint or outlook in life. The third being, again, fundamental attention. Uh, it's essentially attention regulation training. And study after study shows that essentially a wandering mind is a very unhappy mind. And then the fourth concept is generosity. So compassion training specifically will help to cultivate uh, more generosity, which leads to uh, greater well-being. So in terms of the mindfulness research, I kind of grouped this into improvement in symptoms and then sort of the biomarker neuroplasticity. Some of this relates to more psychological functioning and uh, some of the studies have shown a decrease in depression, anxiety, uh, illness related to stress, again with moderate effect sizes, uh, reduced stress and trade anxiety, increase empathy and self-compassion also in healthy populations, not just those that are experiencing uh, different uh, conditions. Um, there is sort of a, more of a higher quality of evidence for uh, reducing depression, uh, more of a sort of moderate sort of quality of evidence out there in terms of uh, mental health related quality of life, and relatively lower in terms of improving physical health uh, related quality of life and pain intensity. And I often um, sort of tell or prime patients that if, if someone's, you're really focused on the, the goal of using mindfulness to reduce pain intensity, um, that that will lead to further suffering. And the intention really of mindfulness is to, re to reduce the suffering in relationship to pain and reducing that suffering that's associated with pain. And that's probably more of an accurate representation of the benefits of, of mindfulness practice in sort of the realm of pain. It's also been shown to help increase coping skills for a number of conditions, chronic pain being one amongst several listed here. And it's also been shown to help reduce uh, fatigue and improve sleep. In terms of sort of the biomarker realm of, of studies, uh, in, in the sort of subfield of psychoneuroimmunology, it's been shown to reduce cortisol levels. The, uh, there's been shown to be greater activation in certain regions of the brain that are associated with positive mood. And it's also been shown to improve your immunological response. And there was a clever study there that looked at the response to an influenza vaccine from Richard Davidson work. Uh, in the sort of subfield of genomics, epigenetics, cellular aging, uh, there has been shown to be a reduction in the expression of pro-inflammatory genes, increased telomerase activity and telomere production. In sort of the realm of neuroplasticity, uh, they've shown some evidence of cortical thickness changes in the brain that have been related to areas uh, associated with cognitive and sensory and emotional processing. There have been shown changes to in, in the neural tracts that are responsible for self-regulation. 
and then at some other changes in uh, uh, brain regions here as well with the practice of meditation. In terms of compassion, I sort of uh, broke this down into compassion for others, the studies that relate to that versus compassion for self. Uh, and it's been shown really even in infants that while compassion can be cultivated, it's also our instinct to be compassionate beings. And they've shown this in, in really just studying infants and their sort of pro-social behavior. Uh, there's again this idea that comp compassion training Mindfulness training helps us to be more socially connected, and we all uh, know that, that social, social connection is really important for our, our physical and mental health, and it's been linked with lower levels of inflammation. And then in terms of the research related to compassion for self or self-compassion training, uh, it's shown relatively large effect sizes between self-compassion and uh, sort of distress, depression, anxiety, and stress, and so forth. It's been related to reductions in tobacco and alcohol use, predicts positive responses to the aging process in the elderly, buffers against negative outcomes in chronic pain, again, more related to that psychological well-being realm. It's been associated to be related with lower stress and anxiety and shame for people with HIV. It's been shown to reduce anxiety, cardiac responses, and alpha amylase for uh, people with heart conditions and then lower levels of infl inflammatory markers, even in healthy individuals. That was a really brief uh, review, um, and if you would like to delve into this further, um, many of these sort of mindfulness research centers that I have listed here uh, have great resource tabs that can get, provide a summary as well as a full length of their publications. Um, if you want something more easily digestible that you can disseminate to patients, the Greater Good magazine uh, provides more kind of a, of a layperson friendly, patient centered sort of languaging, which can be helpful. Um, there's a, a great ebook here from, uh, called Compassion, and it's from Tanya Singer's work at the Max Planck Institute. There's, of course, the NCCIH that has a lot of uh, evidence listed on their website. I point to a couple of uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis, one on more of the psychological well-being, the other more related to chronic pain that you can refer back to if you'd like. Uh, I have this MBSR versus CBT trial here in pain that you might want to refer to um, that, that uh, shows relatively equal effectiveness um, in terms of, of uh, these factors listed here. And I guess I should also mention that if you kind of want to delve into the, the, um, the evidence a little bit more deeply, um, this study that looks at the positive results, the overly high, high amount of positive results that have been demonstrated in RCTs of mindfulness um, is, is also worth a read and investigation. Uh, I think many of the, the authors point to uh, some of the limitations in the beginning phases of, of mindfulness-related research and that they didn't necessarily have active comparative treatment arms. And so that's um, an important consideration when you're, when you're evaluating the evidence. A lot of the more recent future studies are trying to compare mindfulness-based interventions with more active comparative treatment arms, which I think is the, the right direction to go. Okay, so I um, want to transition into a more of a uh, sort of an outline of kind of going into some, oh, three minutes left. So I'm going to sh skip over this, which it kind of reiterates the same point, which is that there's suffering. Suffering has a cause. If we uh, kind of improve our awareness, and, uh, that suffering is essentially lessened. Um, there can be common, there's some common barriers to, to meditation, uh, and I wanted to kind of provide this little 10-step suggestion for you, which might be helpful to disseminate to your patients or also for you to practice. Uh, the first being to create time and space, using a timer, finding a comfortable sitting position, checking your posture, taking a few deep breaths initially uh, before going back to just a regular resting rate, directing your attention to the breath, and then very simply maintaining, trying to maintain attention to the breath, and then just repeating those steps. And then lastly, sort of to be kind to yourself, oftentimes judgment can arise, things like I'm a bad meditator or I can't keep my focus and those kinds of things. And then again, just preparing for a soft landing, sort of slowly transitioning out of that sort of silence and, and before you enter um, your regular daily life. So, so uh, some other common hindrances that can be barriers uh, that are, again, this wanting or desire, whether it's 
wanting to not meditate or desire for something else that you're feeling, changing in postures. There's a sense of not wanting or aversion that is very common, whether it's pain that can, or emotions or thoughts that can uh, sort of arise as you're meditating. Restlessness or worry, another common uh, sort of hindrance to meditation. Sleepiness or lethargy, another common one, and probably the more uh, critical one, doubt. And I bring those up because really all of these um, really aren't really a problem uh, if you don't make them into one. There's problems or sort of strategies to, to work on this, whether it be you know, standing or walking as opposed to sitting or lying down for if you're experiencing sleepiness, for example. So another, a nice people like acronyms, this is a nice one I think to use um, that can kind of also give you a, some sort of quick sort of go-to uh, suggestions in terms of trying to find ways to unwind, quiet the thinking mind, to move gently like something like we just did here, to breathe, maybe starting with a, a deeper inhale and exhaling, focusing on different physical sensations uh, of, from head to toe, palm to palm, to attend to uh, what you see, maybe what you hear, what you taste or smell or touch, listen to nature, uh, resting your mind, watching the thought, letting it go, maybe observing a feeling, connecting, maybe that's experiencing what's happening right now in this moment, discerning what's right for you, noticing the positive in your life, enjoying nature, connecting with community, and expressing your feelings authentically, whether that's dancing, writing, uh, giving yourself to another person in terms of uh, compassion or a hug uh, or stranger or volunteer. Um, in terms of listening, I think a lot of this has been reflected um, with some of the relationship to motivational interviewing and a lot of these concepts really relate to also mindfulness is to when you are with your patients or family or friends to, to be there and listen with presence, with undivided attention, with your eyes, ears and heart, acceptance, curiosity, delight, <laughs> silence, using encouragers, and reflecting. I was going to go through this exercise, this parent share, but I, I'm getting a red light here, so I think um, maybe this is something you can practice after this. And uh, it was essentially just to uh, do a little parent share of having that person uh, who's sharing, talk about a stressful situation in the last few hours and how it's felt in their body. We were gonna switch roles and, and also go through that. And then also uh, reflecting on a moment of gratitude you've experienced. And this is a nice practice that you can use in a group uh, to kind of, again, work on social connection and interoceptive awareness. Here are some other resources for uh, further training in mindfulness and compassion. Happy to share the links of these if you're interested. You can touch base with me offline. Um, here are some scales or measures to use if you'd like to measure this uh, in yourself or with your patients. Uh, I didn't go into my sort of scientific investigation, so again, if you want to uh, chat with me offline about that, I'm happy to do so. We are investigating uh, a mindfulness-based intervention, uh, a large RCT, which is concluding um, in uh, the next few months, and I'll be analyzing the sensory motor features and changes that may occur, along with pain sensitivity that may occur with with that intervention. Uh, these are some of the uh, themes of my research, if you will. I want to express, uh, in closing, my gratitude to the teachers I've had, my mentors related to the field of mindfulness. Um, I'll save the poem uh, due to time. And thank you for your attention. So we have uh, uh, just under 15 minutes for question and answers. Um, I guess the question, I guess the, the question is, who has a question? Uh, if you have, if you do, please put your hand up nice and high so I can see it. I do try to. I don't want to miss any. I do have one right over here to begin with. And if you, if somebody else has a question too, kind of put your hand up so that I can have have, have the next person up. I guess I would also offer if we wanted to do more practice, we could do the the social diet if you'd like, but I'm also happy to, I'm actually more interested in asking questions than answering questions, but <laughs> you're welcome to ask questions if you'd like. Hey, thank you for your talk. Um, I was curious, I'm right here. Where are you? Oh, where are you? 
I'll find oh. the, to the left yeah. side. Oh, okay, thanks. I was curious when when you became interested in mindfulness, and then when you started to implement that in your practice. Mm -hmm. uh, I became interested in mindfulness probably, oh gosh, almost 17, 18 years um, ago, just as more personal practice, and having some friends who were regular meditators. Uh, and was yeah, just drawn to that, drawn to their sort of presence and the qualities they exhibited in working with their, with their patients. They were also physical therapists. So yeah, I got intrigued by that. Um, and then I guess, you know, really within the last 10 years, as you may know, mindfulness is, you know, pretty mainstream now. It's pretty well accepted. And so I probably within the last few years, I was like, yeah, I could actually integrate this. I can actually talk about my personal practice and, and, and investigate it in my research. So that's, I guess, the how that all unfolded. Was, yeah. Our second question is over here. And I just wanted to, can we read the poem? Oh, wow. Would you like me to read the poem? Yes, please. That's my question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, i put this away. I should have this memorized. I've said it so much, but... So this is, um, I, you know, if you're teaching mindfulness, it's, it's, it's often trickled with poems and metaphors. Uh, I think it's things subtle and sink in a little bit. So uh, this is one of my favorite poems by Derek Walcott, Love After Love. The time will come when, with elation, you will greet yourself arriving at your own door, in your own mirror, and each will smile at the other's welcome and say, sit here, eat. You will love again the stranger who was yourself. Give wine, give bread, give back your heart to yourself, to the stranger who has loved you all your life, who you have ignored for another. Take down the love letters from the bookshelf, the photographs, the desperate notes. Peel your own image from the mirror. Sit, feast on your life. Okay, great. I'm glad I got to share that with you. Thanks for asking. <laughs> so, um, I, I, th I believe there was another question right up here towards the front. While the, the microphone's coming over here, um, you, it seemed to me that you incorporated several different types of movement uh, that, or that the movement that we used was maybe inspired by several different types of, pra of practice. I was wondering if you could just take, talk a little bit about uh, hmm. why you chose the ones that you did? Um, I, I don't know if I had a lot of... Uh, well, you know, some of the movements, I guess, would be classified as more Qigong flow-like. There was some mixture of yoga, Tai Chi in there. Um, you know, movement's movement. I think slow movement, breath connecting to the body. I just thought that was uh, given, uh, I suppose, their space and what we had. I thought that'd be a nice uh, mix. So, yeah. <laughs> Hi, right over here. Hi. Um, so when, when I hear of mindfulness in the popular media, oftentimes it's, it's presented as something that we should all be doing and uh, it's good for everybody. I wonder if there's any literature on adverse uh, experiences, um, mm. if, if there's a population or, you know, mm -hmm. categories of, of people that this is not a good idea to recommend or any other kind of cautions that you might offer? Yeah. Um, you know, it was originally developed for, you know, John Kabat-Zinn originally developed mindfulness-based stress reduction for the chronic pain population. I would say that, um, I don't know if there has been a lot of reporting of adverse events. I, I do think that, you know, for people, again, more just uh, personal experience in teaching and leading, it can be sometimes more challenging for uh, people that have migraines or headaches, sometimes, again, that are very sort of sensitive to, to stimulation, um, can find that practice a bit more challenging or difficult. Not to say that they have any serious adverse events from doing it, but it, it can be a very frustrating practice for them. And, and there are also options to Again, not focus on the physical sensations of the body. You can focus on other objects of attention. So for certain people, it might be, you know, vision or hearing. Um, so, I mean, it's, you know, it, it can be very exposure. It's very exposure oriented. And oftentimes when people 
um, as you, you, you know, if you work with patients with pain, they, they want to avoid being present with their body. And so it's, um, it can be confrontational. And I think approaching it with some, some gentleness and giving people other options um, of attention can be helpful. And oftentimes, maybe the movement practice can be an easier transition before getting into a sitting practice. We have a question uh, online in back. Yeah, this question comes from Crystal. Um, John Kabat-Zinn is famous for his work in dealing with chronic pain patients. He's written a book, Full Catastrophe Living, and has a guided meditation DVD that I refer to often. Do you have resources like this available that I could suggest my patients look into? I'm sorry, was it? Was do, that do you have resources that, uh, like guided meditation DVDs or something like that for this person's patients to look into? Oh, yeah. Um, well, sure, yeah. So you referred to the, the, the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program. Uh, on that link, you can find a certified uh, Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction teacher in their area. They also have some online programs uh, that you can um, enroll in online. I don't know if I have that slide, but anyway, yeah. There are um, certainly online programs. There are also local um, programs in uh, MBSR if they wanted a formal eight-week program. Um, or there's also kind of local retreats and meditations. And again, I have the, the links I could share with you there uh, for all those resources. We have another question right in, in back here on the right side. Thanks, um, Nick. I've got a couple of things. I suppose the first thing is I noticed a lot of Buddhist iconography in your slides, and I wondered, so I, I use it in London, and, and we're cautious not to mm -hmm. be overtly uh, adhering to any particular philosophy or religion right. with it. I wondered whether you encountered much uh, resistance to that. Um, and then the second thing, my second question is whether you think it's possible to introduce or signpost people to mindfulness without practicing mindfulness yourself. I didn't catch the last part. The first part I caught, which was, um, you know, are you careful to make the, when you are teaching mindfulness, say, to patients or within a, an MBSR program to, to kind of keep it secular, not bring in a lot of the Buddhist philosophy and psychology? Absolutely, yes. Um, I, I bring some of this up just more as a background for clinicians, um, just to get a sense of the foundations. But, um, yeah, absolutely the intention really was with the development of MBSR to deliver it in a very secular manner. Um, I think it can be helpful just to get a little bit of sense of some of the, of, of the underpinnings of, that are embedded in that secular practice. So I bring that up for this talk. But yeah, uh, patient practice, absolutely. And there can be some connotations in, in terms of does this jive with my religious practice? And, and that can be a, a real you know, important discussion to have for people that might be turned off to meditation. Yeah. yeah. And I, I usually frame it in it's a complementary to whatever spirituality you have and, 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 and tend to not bring in a lot of the Buddhist psychology or philosophy. Yeah. Thank you. And the second point was just uh, your thoughts on people uh, guiding patients who don't practice themselves personally. I'm not Do sure you know, I heard you. Uh, uh, so what your thoughts are on people who guide people in mindfulness if they don't practice themselves personally? Uh, what, what do I think about that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's really important to, to be a, a, an effective teacher to embody the practice and to have a, a, um, you know, a formal practice as well as an informal practice. And um, that's why I think it's helpful to find someone who's qualified, certified, has gone through supervision, uh, teacher training. Um, and um, I think, I think the, the, the teacher facilitator is, is a really critical part uh, to the, the outcomes of, of those groups. So yeah, I would encourage people who are wanting to teach mindfulness to practice it themselves. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question coming in from an online participant, and then we had somebody sitting just a few rows for the, okay, thank you. Uh, this question is, what do you recommend in terms of the frequency and or duration of a mindfulness and compassion practice? Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty common question. Um, I typically say that a moment of mindfulness is better than no mindfulness whatsoever. Uh, so any practice you can bring in, whether even if it's informal mindfulness in everyday activities, um, 
and I'll oftentimes kind of give a little worksheet on ways to integrate mindfulness into everyday practice. That, that can be helpful for some people. I think, to me, it's I want to meet people where they're at. Um, if you are entering, um, say, a formal program over the course of eight weeks, it's a gentle introduction into maybe a five-minute sit and progresses eventually into a 45-minute sit, and also within that even a, a half-day retreat. Um, it can be challenging for people to sit for you know, 20, 30, 45 minutes. I think there's been some research to show that suggests that even 15 minutes of practice can have some beneficial effects to, uh, to the body and mind. So um, I guess my general answer to that is see where you can fit it in and, and, and build your practice from there. And it's to also appreciate that it's very common to have you know, to cycle through this, to have a good practice for some time and to let it drift away and to return to it. And so there's ways to manage that, to sustain your practice. And uh, I can chat about you with that in terms of just creating space. There's a lot of the 10 points things, but just creating space for you and sometimes having connecting with community, going to a weekly meditation retreat or scheduling in a retreat every year or two. You know, there's lots of ways to problem solve around that. But sitting with people is very, uh, very supportive and helpful for people that find this individual practice to be challenging. Great, we have one last question. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you for the guided movement, that felt really good. Um, I'm curious if there's research on or what are your general thoughts on combining mindfulness practice working with patients during touch and manual therapy? Oh. I don't know of, of any. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I certainly will use, you know, if I'm doing an individual consultation, certainly feel fine. If I've worked with the patient for a while, you know, giving them some, some biofeedback, you know, to the belly or, or whatnot. Um, but yeah, typically it is not. You're right. It's typically it's not integrated so much with with touch, I guess because, you know, again, the idea is really to how can you increase internal locus of control, self-efficacy, trusting your own body. But I think it can pair very nicely. And I, I certainly, I touch my patients when it is in sort of that right context and they're inviting me to do that just to facilitate more, probably more of the interoceptive sort of aspect, you know, so, but I don't think it's a contraindication. All right. Well, I hate to say it, but that's the end of our Q&A time here. So please show your appreciation.